Good morning, everybody, and thanks for watching. So I'm going to continue in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, starting in chapter 2, where Paul continues his discussion about our expectation as believers and members of the body of Christ, as well as how we get there or how it's done. So in chapter 2, starting at the end of verse 4, Paul says, He loves us, we also being dead to the offenses and the lusts, vivifies us together in Christ. In grace you are saved, and rouses us together and seats us among the celestials in Christ Jesus. And remember in Colossians chapter 1 verse 5, Paul says that we have an expectation in the heavens. Not an expectation that comes from heaven and is at the earth, so that our expectation will be on the earth. No, our expectation is in the heavens. The work that we will be doing is in the heavens. And now, Paul says here that we're going to be seated together with Christ among the celestials. The celestials are in the heavenly realms. If we look later in this letter, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For it is not ours to wrestle with blood and flesh, but with the sovereignties, with the authorities, with the world mights of this darkness, with the spiritual forces of wickedness among the celestials. So remember, our allotment is with Jesus Christ and his work among the celestials. We participate with him in his faith, his death, his entombment, and resurrection. That's how we obtain our righteousness, by participating with him in that. Now we are participating when he calls that body to himself of which he's the head. We are participating with him among the celestials in bringing the rest of the universe in subjugation to the cross. So that's our allotment. It says nothing of Israel, the twelve tribes, going out from the earth. That is reserved for Israel here on earth. The expectation of the body of Christ is in the heavens, among the celestials. So moving forward here in verse 7, that in the oncoming eons he should be displaying the transcendent riches of his grace in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For in grace... Through faith are you saved, and this is not of you. It is God's approach present, not of works, lest anyone should be boasting. For his achievement are we, being created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God makes ready beforehand that we should be walking in them. This is chapter 2, verses 7 through 10, just absolutely loaded with truth. Let's start with in the oncoming eons, he should be displaying the transcendent riches of his grace in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is what it's about. God is going to display in us the transcendent riches of his grace. And what is grace? Grace is something that's unearned, undeserved. It's given to people that cannot possibly be worthy of it. That's the very definition of grace. How can any human being be worthy of God's transcendent riches? I mean, God is going to lavish, as he said in chapter 1, and pour out everything that he is and has and every blessing on us to demonstrate, like he says here, Paul, the transcendent riches. That's unmeasurable, unthinkable super excessively beyond what a human being can even imagine being poured out on us to demonstrate the transcendent riches of God by giving us this grace. It has nothing to do with us. It's God pouring out his blessing and his riches through grace because no one could possibly deserve what is coming here. No one can deserve it. No one could be righteous enough. 
It's only based on a righteousness that can be given by Jesus Christ and poured out in grace by God on us because our righteousness cannot come from us but it comes from participating being vivified by what Jesus did alone through his faith his death entombment and resurrection it says in uh, skipping forward here in Ephesians 3:20. now to him who is able this is God capital H to do super excessively above all that we are requesting or apprehending so he's going to do more than we can even think. That's how he's going to just bestow riches on us. And then how does this happen? Again, for in grace. Remember, grace is something that cannot be earned. The minute you do something or you commit a work or follow a law or do anything good or refrain from doing anything bad, then grace is no longer grace because you did something to earn it. Grace is given to those who deserve the opposite in which you can't do anything to get it because the minute you do something to get it it's mutually exclusive in the definition because grace is given to those who have done nothing to deserve it. So it's in grace through faith Jesus Christ's faith and we're given a measure of faith as a gift to participate in that but that's given from God as well. I believe it's Romans 12.3 and elsewhere in scripture. We're given the faith. Ephesians 1.4 earlier. We're given that faith before the foundation of the world. 2 Timothy 1.9 and 10. Given the faith before the foundation of the world. So we're given faith to tie in to whose faith? Jesus Christ's faith. So none of it's from us. It's all from God. But we are saved for in grace through faith. So, again, nothing to do with us. Are you saved? And if there's any doubt that the faith comes from us, or God, or if the grace comes from us doing something, or purely from God, it's answered in the next words. So, in grace, nothing we can do to earn it, nothing we can do to lose it. It's given to those who cannot possibly attain to the righteousness of God. For in grace, through faith, Jesus Christ's faith, not our own. But in case we want to delude ourselves into thinking that we can act up independently of God, and it's our faith that saves, are you saved? And here are the words. And this is not of you. I mean, can there be any more direct language here? So here we have the grace and the faith that saves us. And then Paul makes it as specific as he can now. There's no symbology, there's no murkiness in what he says here. He says, the grace and faith that you are saved by, this is not of you. It's not of you. It is God's approach present. It's what God is doing. Not of works, he says it again, just in case anyone wants to inject a work of following the law or doing something good or mustering up enough faith on your own which if it comes outside of God and you muster up faith and someone else doesn't then that's a work that's something you did that someone else didn't do so all that is eliminated here it's not of you it's not of works it says it plainly plain language and that that's why I love Paul's letters I mean it's plain language you you can't deny it you can only deny it if you ignore it there's no symbology there's no um, you know, fancy words where you have to look up, uh, you know, history and figure out what was being said at that time. It's direct language. It's not like the book of Revelations where there's symbols and, and visions and all this other crap where you have a hundred people read the book of Revelations, you'll get a hundred different interpretations and they're all different and they all think they, they got it. You can't interpret this any other way. It's plain language. It is not a view. It is not of works. And then again, lest anyone should be boasting. You cannot boast. If you did a work, if you mustered up enough faith to believe in Jesus Christ and your neighbor didn't, so you're saved and he's not, then you can boast in the fact that you were smart enough to understand what was being said and come up with that faith. You can boast in that. If you did a work to get 
salvation or maintain salvation and another person did it, then that work that you did, you can boast in. Well, at least I did this. This is why I'm saved. But boasting is completely debarred. So you're saved by grace, which eliminates any work of your own, through Jesus Christ's faith. In case you deny that, Paul says this is not of you. It's God's approach present. It's what God's doing, not of works, lest anyone should be boasting. But Christians boast all the time. They say, oh, yeah, we got the message, but you have to understand it and interpret it and apply it. But this, these scriptures here in verse 8 and 9 and 10 completely illuminate that. And it's in plain, direct language. And yet, religious people want to ignore it and still boast in something they did. And, you know, they'll still claim Jesus Christ did it, but the deciding factor on whether it applies to them or not is something they did and someone else doesn't do. So they can boast in that. It is of a work, and it is of what they did. So it denies that it's not of you, that it's not of works, and that you shouldn't be boasting. And now, at the end of verse 10 here, and I spent a lot of time on that. I wasn't expecting to do that, but here I'm going to finish up in verse 10. And I love this, this verse right here. For his achievement are we, being created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God makes ready beforehand that we should be walking in them. Those first five words... For his achievement are we. We aren't doing this. This is not about us. It's not about us doing something and getting the reward and God saying, look what my servant has done. Isn't he awesome? No, that's not what is being done. We are putting up in front of the whole universe. We are being put up as a display of what God can do. We are his achievement. We are his trophy of what he can do and how much he can love and how much grace he can give to his creatures. We're going to be a display of that. That is the opposite of the way of the world, the way of religion, because you have to perform. You have to perform for God. You have to perform for people around you. And then when you get that acceptance, when you achieve something of your own, then you're put up there and you're praised. Look what he did. You did a great job for God. You did a great job in this world. Congratulations. You are awesome. Get your praise. No. God is displaying what he can do. We are his trophy. He is showing what he can do, how much grace he can lavish, the transcendent riches of his grace. That's what he's doing here. He's showing just how much he can bless and glorify. And he's showing everything he can do in us. When people look at us, it's going to be, wow, look at what God did with that creature, with that undeserving, unrighteous creature. God did that. And the minute, and this is why Paul explained this in chapter 7, 8, and 9, the minute you boast, the minute you think it's of you, then you take away God's work. When God lavishes his grace on us, we have to be unworthy of it. That's why it's grace. And because we're so unworthy of it and we're so such lowly creatures that when we get all these riches and we get all this grace and we get all of God's lavishing goodness on us, then everyone's going to see that it's of God. And there's nothing the creature could have done to attain this because it's so high and so great and so above what we can even think that it's going to blow our minds. But that's the setup here. The setup is that it's all of God. That what God can do is going to be shown in what he gives to us. And what we become because we're his workmanship, his trophy, and a display to the entire universe what God can do in us. And then what God can do 
in every single one of his creatures. So God shows what he can do in us first. What a great trophy that is. And then with us, as Jesus Christ's compliment, God does it with every single one of his creatures. That's the expectation for us and for all mankind based on God working through Jesus Christ's faith, his death, entombment, and resurrection.